uh, almost a month ago, I, I saw this post on Facebook where somebody had uh, mentioned something about the Feynman technique of learning. And I kind of made a mental note to do a very short presentation on this. Uh, somehow I didn't find the time. But today being a holiday, I, I thought I'll just uh, briefly touch upon uh, the Feynman technique of learning. Richard Feynman is a very interesting personality. He was a physicist, uh, a Nobel uh, uh, Prize winning uh, physicist and a very, very uh, fascinating personality. So it's, it's kind of granted that he's, of course, uh, an intelligent guy because, uh, you know, you not, you can't be somebody dumb and then win the Nobel Prize in physics. So, um, yes, that's taken for granted. He was very good at what he did. But apart from his knowledge, what was really fascinating is uh, he was a very, very um, down-to-earth personality. You know, he was not like an eccentric uh, phys physics guy talking some rubbish. He was very down-to-earth and a bit of a musician. He used to play the drums, the, the bongo, um, and uh, he used to be part of a band. And if you read his books, these two books, one is a, a series of letters that you see on the left side. And the second one uh, is also equally fascinating. And I also have the audio book on the right side. Uh, surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman, on Audible. So I keep listening to these, uh, uh, this this particular audio recording. And I also read this book. It's one of these two of my favorite books, so, uh, which kind of gives you any, uh, some of the, uh, uh, kind of gives you a look into what an interesting personality Richard Feynman actually was. So what is the Richard Feynman method of learning? Uh, the Feynman technique is very simple. What Richard Feynman said was there's a big difference between knowing the name of something and actually knowing something. So if you want to find out if somebody actually knows something, uh, what you need to do is choose a concept that you want to learn about and ask yourself whether uh, you're able to teach what you've learned to a, an 11-year-old. Just pretend that there's an 11-year-old uh, child in front of you and you're trying to uh, tell the, what you've learned about this particular subject to an 11 year old and if you're not able to do that that means you probably haven't understood it properly okay so note down which areas are you not able to uh, explain to an 11 year old and then go back uh, and understand the concept better so that you can explain it better so uh, in a nutshell if you're not able to uh, explain it in very simple terms to, a, to even an 11 year old child that means you probably haven't understood it better so in a nutshell, that's what the Feynman technique for learning is all about. Um, so uh, uh, this is the, the quote that he used to tell very often, Richard Feynman. You say there's a lot of difference between knowing something and knowing the name of something. Okay? Uh, uh, Charlie Munger, who was the who is the vice president, who's who's, who's the number two in uh, um, Warren Buffett's organization. Um, also said something similar. He said there's a big difference between true knowledge and uh, pretend knowledge. Uh, the Feynman technique of learning, when you read about this, you invariably will come up across two more terminologies, which is Batesian mimicry and Schoffer wisdom. So let's just take a, a look at what these two terminologies mean. Now, Batesian mimicry is something that you see in nature. It's where uh, one uh, species uh, uh, will try to mimic uh, its counterpart just to gain some benefits just for survival. So what you see is this a beautiful picture from BlennyWatcher.com. Uh, on the top, the, these fishes look almost the same. But if you look closely, you realize the one on top is a striped flying benny, which is known as the model, which is because it's the original. Okay, So it's a very toxic fish. And if a predator eats this fish, then uh, either the predator dies or it's going to feel very sick. Okay, So it's not a good fish to eat and most predators know this and so they avoid the striped flying mini. Now the one on the bottom here, the juvenile bream, looks more ferocious than this one but in, in reality it's a very edible fish. So this guy is a mimic. He tries to copy this, uh, the model just so that it can get some benefits. So the predator who comes uh, tends to look both of these and they look quite similar. And thinking that this guy is quite similar to the striped flank when he will probably avoid eating him. So the mimic, which is a juvenile bream, mimics the model, which is the striped flank bunny. So this is a what we call petition mimicry. And you know, if you look, look at, read across this, you will see similar examples in butterflies and several other things just to survive. Okay, so. This is what you see. Now, what's the problem with Batesian mimicry? The problem is if the population of the mimic increases. Now, who knows about, uh, who knows who is the uh, the mimic and who is the model? Not not the predator, because the predator, when he looks, it looks the same. So predators can't tell the difference, but the model knows the, the truth and the mimic also knows the truth. The mimic knows that it's imitating this one. The mimic knows it's not toxic. And the model 
uh, also knows what he or she is capable of. Now, the problem is if the number of mimics are lesser than the actual model, then things are fine. What happens is if the number of mimics, if the population of the mimics increases more than the model, then things start happening. So the survival of the model then becomes in danger because then what's happening is the mimics will be too large in number and the actual models get lost in the number of mimics. So what usually happens is a predict will come and eat the mimic and, find, and it will start thinking it's fine. And then once it starts feeling that way because there's so many mimics out there that the predators keep swallowing these. And then when an actual striped flying bunny comes along, the predator cannot distinguish. It, it starts thinking that it's okay to eat this one as well. So once in a while, a few predators might die, but because the number of mimics are larger, then the model starts losing its relevance and uh, gets driven into extinction. And you kind of see that in human life as well. So if you, uh, there are kind of parallels in that. So an easier way to explain that is to look at Charlie Munger's example of uh, what, we, what he used to call plant wisdom versus uh, chauffeur wisdom. Now, what does that mean? It's a very funny story. Max Planck was an award-winning uh, uh, physicist again, and uh, once he uh, won the Nobel Prize, uh, uh, he was invited to a lot of lectures. So he used to travel across uh, Germany and several parts of Europe giving lectures, uh, and his chauffeur used to always uh, drive him around. Okay, so. His uh, chauffeur, because of the fact that he used to go to all the lectures that Max Planck gave, uh, became quite um, adept in whatever Max Planck was talking. So he, he kind of got used to the lecture. He kind of memorized the whole lecture. And he reached the stage where this chauffeur could actually deliver the lecture even better than Max Planck. Because he knew everything what Max Planck was saying. Because it was the same lecture delivered in different different venues. And at every lecture, the chauffeur was sitting in the uh, in the audience. And he kind of memorized the whole thing, and, it, and including the mannerisms. So one day, the chauffeur said, Mr. Planck, um, you know, I've been attending this for so long, and I kind of know your, uh, um, your entire speech by heart. So why don't you give me a chance to deliver your speech in Munich? And both of us look almost similar. So let's try and see whether the audience... Uh, uh, are able to find it out, find out or not. So Max Planck was said, to, it said, why not? And then, um, so Max Planck took off the shopper's hat and wore it. And uh, he, uh, they went to uh, the lecture in Munich and uh, the chauffeur uh, got on stage and gave a fantastic lecture, even better than Max Planck. So uh, once the lecture was over, uh, the audience couldn't make out, you know, who was giving the lecture. And Max Planck was sitting in the audience wearing the chauffeur's hat. But after the lecture, somebody in the audience just got up and asked something, a very simple question. And Schoffer, being, because of the fact that he only was just imitating Max Planck, he was actually not Max Planck, uh, he didn't know what to answer. Okay? He, he knew he could memorize a speech, but he, he didn't know what to answer. So uh, he looked at the audience member who asked the question, and then he said, uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in an important city like Munich, I didn't expect such an ignorant question. You know, this question is so ignorant and so basic that even my chauffeur can answer this. And then he pointed out to his chauffeur, which was actually Max Planck in the audience. So uh, the story is interesting because it's not to demonstrate the quick wit or the quick thinking uh, you know, uh, capability of the chauffeur, but to uh, know the difference between what uh, Charlie Munger calls Planck wisdom versus chauffeur wisdom. Or, or, or other way to look at it is the original versus a mimic. So if you look at Planck wisdom of people who have Planck wisdom or originals, they've spent time, you know, they've paid their dues in a particular field. So they've spent enough time. So they are the real deal. They know what they're talking. They can explain things in very simple language if somebody asks. And they clearly know their circle of competence. Okay? They will not teach things that they don't really, really understand. And the other very fascinating thing of people who are originals who, or who have what they call Planck wisdom is they're not afraid to say, I don't know. You know? And that's the best way to identify a mimic from an original is the originals will always are not afraid to say, you know what, I don't know. I'm not sure. Or the other third thing they always say is, I was wrong then. You know? I was wrong to do this five years ago, but now uh, I know that I was wrong. So my point of view has changed. So these are some of the characteristics of someone who has Planck wisdom or the original wisdom. Whereas people who have Schoffer wisdom or also known as the mimics, they they are mostly inexperienced. Okay, So they, they just see once, they do once, and then they start teaching immediately. So they don't really understand things at a, 
at a proper grassroots level. They use a lot of jargon and heavy words to mask their lack of knowledge. So they look like the real deal, but they're not the real deal. And they don't have any definitive circle of competence. They teach anything that they understand superficially. So they can go there and they can pretend to be the chauffeur. I mean, they're actually chauffeurs who pretend to be the originals, uh, but it's very difficult to catch them or very difficult to make out. And one sure way to make out the chauffeurs from the blongs or the mimics from the original is that uh, the mimics very rarely will use these words. I don't know, I'm not sure, and I was wrong. You won't find mimics use these terminologies. They're very, very sure about uh, what they say. So in a nutshell, this is what it is. Blanc wisdom versus chauffeur wisdom and original versus mimic. Now, when we say these things, immediately when we see this in uh, others, it's very easy to point out the mimics in the other, in, when we see others. But the other thing we have to look at is not look at uh, uh, mimics in others, but in ourselves too. Now, are we genuine or are we mimics? Are we pretending to be someone else? So we need to have this, uh, uh, this self-introspection. And once you have self-introspection to keep evaluating whether we are genuinely, uh, whether we genuinely know what we're talking about. Um, and this, this, this kind of self-introspection will help us remain grounded. And this in turn will lead to continuous learning because we know that you know learning is a continuous process. And uh, this will in turn lead to a growth mindset because we know that we are not the people we are not uh, going to be the people we are we can change if we keep continuing to learn and that, that's what we call a growth mindset. we can continue to grow by understanding what we truly are